Well, what good good morning, everybody. You know, this is um, it's indeed an honor. It's also uh, hopefully a very propitious moment. As you know, um, uh, our speaker today has spoken with us before. It was brief. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he's right. It was a it was more of an AV encounter than a technical uh, troubleshooting matter, which unfortunately was never troubleshot, and uh, we did miss out on, on hearing from Keith. The good news, of course, is that Keith is here, and I believe the AV problems, at least for us, won't be an issue. Um, uh, Keith Jerome, um, uh, first of all, I little uh, an aside, you should know this, is that Keith and I actually started at Duke Medical School together in uh, 1985, I think it was August or something like that, 1985, and spent two years uh, in the basic science aspects of Duke before we launched off on PhD programs. Keith, I think, stayed at Duke, and I had couldn't, I had itchy feet and headed to England, but uh, we wound up both graduating from Duke in 1993, um, having started so long, a long, a long time. So Keith is full of good information about me, but be careful, Keith, I have good information about you. <laughs> so, uh, but nonetheless, I, it's really a pleasure and a privilege to be, invite um, Dr. Keith Jerome here today to speak with us. Um, I'm gonna give you a little story about him. He is the head of the virology division at the University of Washington Department of Laboratory Medicine, and he's the professor of vaccines and infectious disease division at Fred Hutch. Of course, as I mentioned, Keith got his MD and his PhD from Duke University, completing his postdoc training in laboratory medicine and virology at the University of Washington. His clinical focus is on the diagnosis of viral infections and the role that the laboratory can play in improved patient care. Dr. Jerome has published extensively on pathogen host interactions and immune evasion by herpes viruses, and is now pioneering the use of DNA editing endonucleases as a potentially curative therapy for previously incurable viral infections, including the HIV, hepatitis B, human papillomavirus, and herpes. He currently serves as a co-PI of Defeat HIV, one of three NIH-funded Martin Delaney collaborations dedicated to developing curative therapies for HIV. In addition to his basic research efforts, Dr. Jerome leads the Diagnostic Virology Program at the University of Washington. Under his guidance, the program is designed and implemented molecular testing assays for a wide variety of human viruses, including HIV, hepatitis B and C, enterovirus, BK virus, and cytomegalovirus. The laboratory provides diagnostic support for stem cell transplant in other patients in the Pacific Northwest and throughout the country through its reference testing services. So with that, I invite Dr. Jerome to tell us today about the new humanized mouse models for HPV gene editing. Here. Well, thanks, uh, Randy. It's, it's fun to get to visit again. We bump into each other every couple of years, always at, at, in a nice location, whether it's Hawaii or Cabo or someplace. But uh, now it's here, which is also great. Um, yeah, I tried to give my talk. I forget when now, six or eight months ago, and it didn't work. But, you know, the silver lining, and there's always a silver lining, has got to come here in person, which is great. It's so much better. It's also great to leave Seattle in November because it's abysmal there in November. It's great. You know, it doesn't look like that in November. So it's wonderful to be here. So thank you for the invitation. I'm going to talk about our uh, humanized mouse models. Um, but I'm going to talk about those mostly in the context of gene editing uh, for chronic viral infections. Um, I'll show you our data in gene editing for hepatitis B, and I'm going to compare and contrast that with uh, gene editing we've done for another virus, herpes simplex, that I work on quite a bit, because I think there's some lessons there, um, largely in terms of where we want to be, because uh, you know I, I don't want to steal my own punchline, but I'll tell you we're much farther along in gene editing for herpes than we are for hepatitis B. And I'll tell you that the lack of a good and tractable and affordable mouse model has been a lot of what's held us back. And so I think we've, we've solved that. So I'll show you some of the experiments that are ongoing now. Um, and, and hopefully uh, in the not too distant future, we'll have some, some really good results in, in gene editing for hepatitis B. Uh, so I work at a cancer center, Fred Hutch. Um, and as such, you know, I, you need to justify why you work on viruses. And it's not too hard for this group because you know you work on hepatitis B, which is an enormous cause of cancer. But um, 
you know, about a quarter of cancers probably have something to do with viruses, uh, particularly human papillomavirus and hepatitis B, but also HIV. Um, and even herpes simplex, um, only because about half the cases of HIV in, in Sub-Saharan Africa are actually attributable to prior HSV infection, um, just making infection easier, okay? Because essentially herpes draws more T cells uh, into the genital tract, and so there's, there's a higher uh, incidence of transmission. So all these are associated with cancer, and we really generally don't have in my opinion, the therapies that we'd like to have for these persistent viral infections. We, we can control things um, with HIV. We can control the infection quite well with combination antiviral uh, therapy. Uh, with hepatitis B, we know we have drugs that can suppress the virus, uh, probably lead to better outcomes, but generally we don't cure people. And then for herpes simplex, uh, you can suppress the virus. Uh, it can reduce recurrences, reduce transmission, but it's only partial protection from both of those. Um, and so we really don't have, the suppressive therapies aren't really what we want. And for all these viruses, what people would really like to have is cure. They would like for the virus to be gone. And if you work in HIV, only a slight exaggeration to say it's all anybody's talking about now is cure. But it, it is an exaggeration, but it's an enormous effort. We talked about the Martin Delaney laboratories, which that's a little bit out of, out, out of out of date right now, but uh, but those those are there dedicated toward the idea of developing an HIV cure, and we've seen traction uh, in the hepatitis B field. Those of you who go to the meeting, uh, the workshop know there's more and more interest in cure, and at least the recognition of cure as a valid long-term goal. I'll leave here tonight, get on the train, head down to Washington D.C., uh, and tomorrow and Friday. Um, We'll be meeting, there's a meeting that's been convened by NIH and CDC to talk about everything herpes simplex. And part of my goals there is to actually introduce the idea into that field of cure as a valid approach. In my opinion, if we're gonna have 600 scientists in the world who care enough about that infection to actually travel to the meeting, some of them ought to be thinking about developing a cure, um, just like we're thinking about for these other ones. So. Um, right now, basically, the metaphor here is right now we are sort of plucking the, you know, the, the, we're, we're pulling the weed, the top of the weeds in our garden, right, with these persistent viral infections. But as soon as you stop plucking, as soon as you stop that suppressive therapy, the infection comes back. And the issue is that these infections have some sort of persistent viral form. There's integrated latency for HIV, there's episomal latency for herpes, there's persistent. Uh, CCC DNA for hepatitis B. So is there some way we can actually uh, attack that 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 long lived form? So um, you know, can we actually get down to the roots of those of those dandelions and pull them out? So you'd either have to get rid of the infected cells. You think of that that in the liver potentially because of the regenerative potential. Um, you have a lot of T cells. Maybe you can get rid of the few that are latently infected with HIV. Probably can't do that for herpes because we really don't want to kill neurons because you can't replace them effectively. So we've been using gene editing enzymes and you guys know, you know, everybody knows about these now. And everybody's intimately familiar with CRISPR-Cas. Um, this is an RNA guided uh, gene editing enzyme. There's a, a wide variety of these. So uh, most of us worked uh, with Cas9, that's the best developed. There's a number of other Cas family uh, molecules as well as a lot that are sort of in development from, from various private entities, variations on this, but they all find their specificity uh, through a guide RNA that actually forms a, 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 a complementation with a DNA target and therefore guides the nuclease activity there and, and therefore induces a double strand break in DNA. Um, the, the purpose of this slide is just to point out that CRISPR-Cas is a tool for gene editing. CRISPR-Cas is not gene editing. Um, and we've actually used all of these, and we continue to be very interested in uh, what are called here homing endonucleases, or sometimes called mega nucleases. And despite the name mega, th these pictures are roughly the scale. You can see it's actually a, a small molecule. We actually like that because it's easy to package into delivery vectors, uh, particularly AAV because of the coding capacity. Uh, this molecule will barely fit into AAV. This fits in super nicely. You can do a bunch of AAV tricks to, to have really high level expression. Uh, that may be advantageous for some applications. All right, so the basic idea is these things introduce double-strand DNA breaks 
Um, and so if you, they recognize a very specific target of interest, in this case, maybe it's a virus. Uh, you know, we'll talk about episomal viruses because you know, we're talking about hepatitis B or, 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 or I'll show you some herpes data. They're both limited circles and cells. So you induce a break. Um, we found that in episomes, and I'll say that really this, this insight really came from Camel's work, I'll say uh, in HIV targeting integrated virus, uh, work and also you know very convincingly that um, if you made a, a cut in the LTR of the virus, it tended to get it sized out. It was actually removed um, compared to inducing a single break and then hoping for some sort of uh, mutagenic event introduced in Dell or something like this. Uh, the higher kind of higher efficiency effort uh, approach is to make two cuts. Uh, and if you do that in an episome, instead of getting these things that recircularize and repair very effectively, you get two parts and they tend to fall apart and get degraded. And so whenever we try to target a virus that lives as a circle, we'll generally try to, try to cut it twice. And, and we just see more degradation, degradation is better. You know, but it also gets around the issue that we dealt with early on when we were trying to actually just inactivate the virus by causing indel and essential gene. We also had to explain to activate, you know, to, to, to community folks, well, you're, you're, going to, you're still going to have the virus, but it won't be able to do anything. People didn't like that, okay? And so it's just really nice to say, if we make these two cuts, it goes away. And literally, the body gets rid of it, and people love it. So for multiple reasons, that's a good thing. Uh, okay, so let's take our little bit of segue into herpes biology. I, I think it's relevant. I actually work, as you can sort of tell, pretty actively in three different viruses, HIV, hepatitis B, and herpes. I think that more people should do that. I think that too many people are specialized in a single virus. Um, I don't think everybody should do that, but I'm always surprised um, that so few people do that because I think there are actually lessons between the viruses and, and, and we should have a few people looking at those. So here, uh, unlike FSB, herpes is actually latent. So if, when it goes into a cell, it really shuts essentially everything down except it does make a little bit of one transcript called lab. Other than that, it's completely silent. Um, so latency is established in neurons of sensory and autonomic ganglia. So uh, these innervate uh, the head and neck region or the lower spinal region after genital infection. Um, and this is where latency is. So this is not a liver. It's a little tiny thing. And each of those ganglion, I like to think in logs. So I, you know, I always just, I love this 10,000, 10,000 neurons there, okay? And all of your latencies in those 10,000 neurons. And of those, about 10% are infected. Okay, so you have about a thousand cells there, and each one of those has about 10 of these little circles. Perfect. So that is the entire target there. Okay, so when we think about, you know, solving the issue about kilograms of liver containing CTP DNA, this is a very different thing. You're talking about a couple of thousand neurons you need to effectively hit and gene edit, and then you could really do something. So um, anyway, these ganglia, the virus lives there latent. Periodically, it reactivates. The virus starts to, 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 to wake up. Uh, components of the virus go back down the neuron that it, that it used to, to, to access the neuron in the first place. It, you know, it came in in the skin. It went down here, established a lifelong latency. Now it wakes up, goes back down, reassembles right out here, and then is shed at the surface and therefore can go on and cause lesions and transmit to a different person and so forth. So all of this biology, this reactivation and shedding is driven largely by how much is here. So the other nice thing about herpes is if we could get a log reduction in the amount of viral reactivation, we would hypothesize that should reduce, if you reduce the viral load by a log, you should get less reactivation. I'm going to show you, we finally have data that, that that's the case. So we use meganucleases for this work. We have used CRISPR-Cas. I'm not showing you data because it didn't work very well. I don't fully understand why. I have some hypotheses, but I, I don't know. Um, so th this is a collaboration long-term with a French company called Selectus that originally developed these meganucleases. Um, they target a couple genes. Unless you're a herpes geek, you won't know what these are. But one's a major capsid protein, and one is a viral delay polymerase. We have a control one. Uh, and so forth. But, you know, to a first approximation, they're sort of like the CRISPR cats. They just make a double strand break in DNA. And we'll put two of them in. Uh, I won't push this too hard other than to say this shows you how slow things work. And you probably, you know, 
eight years ago, they could actually infect cells in a culture dish with herpes, uh, establish a latent infection there, and then treat it with a meganuclease, and you could actually get some gene editing. Um, and, and it wasn't much, actually. Uh, you know, the, the efficiency of this was, you know, maybe five or 10% of, of the total herpes was gene edited. So it's not lost. It's, you know, we're only using one enzyme at the time. So this induced indels in about, we'll say at best, 10% of the herpes. So you could gene edit a virus that was actually not really clear eight years ago, but you could do it, but that's not enough to actually have clinical use. Okay, so is it worth pursuing? Um, you know, we felt early on it was important to take all of this work into animal models. And I still see people, and those of you in the field still see people submitting papers where they've taken cells in the dish infected with some virus and they want to gene edit it. You know, yeah, we can do that, okay? And, you know, even doing that with a different virus that hasn't been edited before, it's just, it, it's pretty obvious now. But when you start to try to use it in an animal, you start to deal with all the issues that actually go to make a therapy. How are you going to get it to where it needs to go? How much needs to be there? How does it interplay with the replenishment of the reservoir? All these issues. So we developed a, a mouse model for herpes. Uh, we, we didn't develop. We, we, we uh, implemented it. It's actually an old model. You, you just make little scratches on the cornea of a mouse, and then you put a drop of, uh, of solution containing herpes virus on there. And the mouse gets a little eye infection and, and they'll get some, some uh, swelling and redness around that site. It, that'll resolve in about two weeks. And if you wait after a month, everything is completely calmed down. The mouse looks really normal. It? it has latent herpes and it's getting it now. Okay? Um, generally in mice, some like people, it doesn't reactivate spontaneously. It's very, very rare. We can detect it, but it's unusual. And they generally don't get recurrent lesions and blisters and things. Um, but we established the latent infection in mice, and then we decided to use our meganuclease to package it up into an adeno-associated virus sector. This time we're using AV1. Uh, put that into the whisker pad of the mouse, wait a month, and ask, can we see gene editing in vivo? And at this time, no one had done any gene editing with actual viral infection in vivo. So as far as I know, the first demonstration of that um, and the gist of it was, you bet, you could actually see that. So 30 days later, we take the ganglia out of the mouse and sequence it. Now we're doing NGS. We could see in our best animals, two to 4% of the virus is gene edited. Okay. So yes, it was gene edited in vivo. Still not nearly enough to mean anything. There was no difference in viral loads in these animals. I didn't even show the data, but we could do it. So about that time, we had a couple of insights. One was this idea about making two cuts. We realized that if you made two cuts, suddenly, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll steal my own thunder, you can actually start to see reductions in viral load, which we had never seen before. We also realized that we needed to do a lot of work on understanding how AAV works. So I showed you AAV1. Um, we came to the realization that these neurons are made of, or, or these ganglia are made of neurons that are all different. They're not all the same. They're subsets of neurons that are phenotypically different. And herpes likes some better than others, as does AAV. So we actually went to single cell sequencing and simply asked, what are the neuronal subsets in trigeminal ganglia, as well as another ganglia around the head and neck that's infected the superior cervical ganglia? Um, where do our vectors go and where does herpes go? Well, that's basically what this is showing. Um, first, of, so this is these are Tisney plots from 10x sequencing back when this was actually a little bit unusual to do. But you can see the superior cervical ganglia and the trigeminal ganglia actually are completely different ganglia. One's autonomic, one sensory. It's not too surprising, but completely distinct and segregated differently. And then you can actually look at our different um, types of AAV. They're all shown here in red and say which ones, you know, which AAV type uh, likes to go to different sorts of neurons. You see AAV1 actually really liked the TG, didn't like the the superior cervical ganglia very well, whereas AV8 loves superior cervical ganglia. Okay, so, so this is really the thing that we've largely gone to use some combinations of AV to try to hit all the ganglia. Um, although recently, and I won't go too deeply in this, we've actually been simplifying back down to a really nice neurotropic uh, type of AV. Um, and then you can actually see where herpes is as well and, and start to understand that it's really how well your overlap occurs 
you know, it's all about delivery in this sort of thing. Yeah, in this case, the AAV is it's not replicating, it's just you're sending it in. Yeah, so so to make these AAV vectors essentially an AAV is a virus that we've all been exposed to, but for an AAV vector, you actually take out everything except the very terminal repeats on the end, you put in your trans beam. Uh, and then you package them up and help a virus. So, so you can't replicate. So this has to replicate up to the. So how do you get into the neuron? Yeah, that, that's a great question that I completely skipped over. So we originally picked A V. Originally started this project thinking about using Joe Glorioso's perfume vector. That's good. I thought it was good. Yeah, and at the time they're really hard to work with because perfume is big. It's 150,000 kilobytes. If you're using cosmids and backmids and all, and it was it was a pain. A V is tiny, small, easy to work with. And there were reports that AAV could travel up the same molecular motors that herpes uses. Well, the exon, so let's try that. So that's why I put it in the Lister band, right? Because that's intermediated by the same trigeminal ganglion. So it's going to travel up there. And it didn't require that you couldn't go into the cornea because that might require you a little bit of replication. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can put it on the cornea, it never works. Yeah, yeah. People always try to replicate. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. So but you put it in the whisker pad. The idea was we actually did it subdermally. Um, so it was right there where the nerve endings are. Now we subsequently found that you know all the work we don't show, we actually have slightly better results by just doing it intravenously than subcutaneously in the whisker pad. So all of these are just well, I'll show you exactly this shot into the bloodstream. And it's known now that certainly AV types actually cross the blood ganglion, you know, blood PNS barrier pretty effectively, AV9, which is one a lot of us have used, for example. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the roundabout way, we worried about that issue. You know, a lot of this is, frankly, has been in here, you know, figuring out what works. Um, okay, so about two years ago now, we sort of thought we had this pretty well figured out. So to show you, you know, how it works, <laughs> um, so this is a triple AV combination that we really like, ARCH10, AV1, AV8. So I showed you one and eight have very different sorts of, 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 of profiles as to what neurons they go to. ARCH10 is kind of more of a pan, a neurotropic virus. But basically, here's the viral loads down the animals. So they're going to deliver two different meganucleases, M5 and M8 both. So there's a pretty complicated thing. There's essentially six species that go in here. You know, the three AV types times two different payloads. PJV only carries one. But if you use this, here's the ganglion viral load of our controls. Each, each ganglion has a little over uh, 10,000 copies of herpes simplex. And then we do our therapy, we reduce it by a lot. Okay, so we get rid of over 90% of the virus out of the spear cervical ganglion. Uh, never works, it's cut off a little bit, but never works quite as well in PG consistently. We see slightly less. And you saw the delivery is a little bit different. Um, so when people think about head and neck infection, they typically think about the trigeminal ganglion as being where the infection is. Um, you can see it. I don't know why there's a bias towards that. It's also known to go into these autonomic ganglia, ciliary ganglia, it's very cervical. Um, nobody's ever really figured out in human what's more important. <laughs> so we actually worried, well, I'll set this up as a worry for you. Um, well, if I consistently get better gene editing in the cervical, not quite as good in TG, you know, maybe I haven't hit what's really important, you know. So we definitely spent some time worrying about that. Um, okay, so let's go on. Oh, yeah. So, so basically, uh, TG, SCG, slightly different head and neck infection. One of the things we've subsequently done is to ask about genital infection. Um, so the, the, the genital tract is, in, uh, is innervated by neurons of the dorsal root ganglia that lie along the spines. Um, if you, those are sensory ganglia, so you might think they're more like PG, so that might be a problem. Does the therapy work very well or not? Well, the answer is, and we we're very happy to see this, if you establish a genital infection of the mice and then treat them essentially exactly like I showed you, you get fantastic reduction there. So in some animals, a two log or complete elimination of all virus from them. So it really works well with DRG. So, you know, there's something about, there may be physiological barriers that those are more accessible, um, but it really doesn't seem to be a, a, much of a problem. And then here's the big question. So we did 
again, because I've worked so much in HIV and then, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time in community groups and, and trying to understand what people think about therapy and cure and gene therapy and all this, we didn't have a lot of understanding of the social sciences around cure. So we went to people who were living with HSP and just said, hey, if there were a cure, what, what would you like to see in a cure? What would be good about it? Would you be in a trial? You know, what, what's the best thing about it? And what people care about, number one, is they don't want to transmit the virus, you know, to a child, to a partner, to just anyone. So um, that was number one. And, and but actually pretty clearly. Um, so we want to answer the question, if I can get a log reduction in herpes or maybe a two log under some circumstances, does that mean it? Does that reduce shedding? Does that reduce the incidence of lesions? So we developed a model in which we could actually induce reactivation from these mice. I told you they don't spontaneously reactivate very well. But again, from the HIV field, we became aware of a molecule called JP1, it's a promo domain inhibitor. Uh, it's been evaluated as a latency reversing agent for HIV, probably doesn't have long term legs for that. But it can also wake up herpes, it turns out. And if you give it to mice, you can force reactivation from their eyes, and you can actually live with that. So I simply did an experiment, same experiment I showed you here. We're going to get this, in this case, a 94% reduction in SCG viral loads. You can see some animals are completely negative. Uh, and the TG, pretty good, pretty good effect on TG in this experiment, over 70%. And then we do JQ1 a couple of times and we just say, what is, what's the effect on, on viral shedding? And, and these are complicated look at. So I'll just show you the, the, the area under the curve for each one. So um, in, in our first reactivation, uh, this, is, this, this is a dose escalation study, but if you just look at the highest dose, we reduced shedding by 98%. Okay, on the first try, second try at 75%, maybe a little experimental noise. And then, then the third, uh, reactivation of actually none in three animals. Okay, so you've had a tremendous difference in the frequency of reactivation, and so I've probably shown this some pretty aggressive statistic. Um, not only reducing the frequency of shedding, but also the amount. So um, there's pretty clear data that if herpes is shed below a certain point, it can't transmit between people. And the levels that we do see in the shedding mice are below that. Now, you know, there's some math modeling in that, and it may be proven, but I think we have a good chance of actually making a difference in people's health. Question. So, yeah, could you go back and see what is left in the second reactivation? The after reactivation, how many, what the percentage of the virus that ate? Uh, yeah, so we've done that. So, so again, and just with the, just the therapy alone, in the trigeminal ganglion, we typically get rid of about 65, you know, 65 to 75 percent of the genome. Of the genome. The DNA. Yeah, so the total viral, so the total viral load, we do this by digital PCR, it's very yeah. accurate read. Total viral load there in our least successful site is maybe a third or quarter of what it was before. In the ganglion that we're good at, it might be a tenth or one of hundred of what it was. Wow. Um, when you reactivate with JQ1, we've done this very carefully. JQ1 alone has no effect, zero effect on how the game that is. Yeah, so because we were interested, it's really unclear in, in herpes biology mechanisms of maintenance of the reservoir, if it's just there and it's there forever or is it kind of reseeded. Um, so we did that. We actually did pick animals, we just reactivated them seven times over about three months. And I don't have the data, but it's just rock stop. It, it almost looks fake. I mean, it's just no difference whatsoever. And we've done that in the context of the therapy, and the JQ1 doesn't it doesn't seem to. Um, there's no evidence that when we do this, like the the reservoir can be refilled, you know, as the virus reactivates and goes back. It doesn't seem to be. That's something we're doing a, a lot. I'm going to transition, I promise, a <laughs> um, And we've worried about that a lot because we can't really completely dampen viral replication. And we know that, you know, there is a continual replenishment uh, of CCP DNA. All right. So I'm going to transition. I promise that. So clearly that's the thing, you know, this can work and this can work really well. But I'm not sure that, we'll, well, I know we're not there yet for hepatitis B. So, you know, this group, I don't need to show much about the life cycle. But remember, there's a long lived DNA form here. I'd love to take some scissors and cut that up. All right. So, like 
you know, nothing too unique here, but, uh, you know, we published this a couple of years ago. So we selected, you know, we looked at the genome and looked at conservation and, and, and sites and we hit a couple of different ORFs and things that are predicted to be good uh, uh, guide RNAs. And then screened several candidates and ended up with two that we took forward, which we called C7 and 14. We just our internal numbering system. We're, we're done with that. Um, this just shows that they work particularly well. So I won't go into that too much. Um, and then we worked with mice that were with FRG mice that were developed by Yakuris, a company um, in Portland, so kind of our part of the country. They have uh, commercialized this model. Uh, it was originally from an academic lab. Um, and then they partnered with a company called Seventh Wave in St. Louis, who was comfortable working with hepatitis B. So the animals got shuffled around. We worked with them um, to evaluate our therapy. Um, I will tell you, we could barely do this experiment. And, and, and I want to make this point. You know, why did, why did we have success with perfidies? Because I showed you a bunch of graphs fairly quickly over 20 minutes. We have probably said, I don't even know, and, and I, you know, I, I hate to put numbers on, but it would probably measure in, you know, over a thousand months, frankly, that we have dealt with the herpes, because this process has been iterated. The groups that I show you, typically a control or experimental group, would be 12 animals for groups, and get very robust statistics on viral uh, reduction. Um, and every time we do experiment, it's better. Okay, so I'm kind of showing you end results of a lot of optimization. I'm going to show you one experiment, okay, in hepatitis B. And the fact was, we could hard, we really couldn't afford to do the experiment other than I bothered them so long that they said, well, you know, you, you tell us you can't afford mice, but it turns out that we have some mice that, that were used for us, you know, for a corporate sponsor, and I can't tell you who it was, but they're done, and we're pretty sure their small molecules locked out. If you want them, <laughs> you know, we'll give it to you at cost. And so we were able to do about Two dozen mice. You know, we always call them you know, previously owned mice. <laughs> uh, and you know, they were actually at the end of their lifespans, and some just died of being old mice by the end. And you know, so it was not optimal, but but we did get some information. So anyway, all right, uh, liver humanized mice. You can infect them. Now you've got a mouse with human liver. You can infect them with hepatitis B, and then we're going to treat them with an AAV that contains our Cas9, our two guides. And we're just going to evaluate them uh, over time. So uh, they'll be infected. I, I want to in, I want to suppress recycling of of HPV. So we're going to give them entecavir to do so. Um, we'll have a control group uh, that just has an irrelevant guide targets uh, GFP. Uh, our our actual animals. Some will look at early on uh, at the time that we take entecavir away. See we've done. And then some will take it and take a beer away. And then now you hope that we were going to prevent rebound by Rania if we took away and take it here. So that's what it looks like. Uh, this is showing a lot of the same thing. So here it is. There's our guides, 7 and 14. And here is a, a little bit analogous to what I showed you before for herpes. Like, you know, how much genetic thing do we have? Remember, I showed you in our failed experiment from five years ago, when it was. For our first success, we had two to four percent, right? Not too thrilled, but it showed. Okay, here, great. We have gene editing again. Uh, what are we now? You know, uh, the mutation rate is uh, 0.4 percent, right? You know, so it's measured in the fractions of a percent. So we definitely have gene editing. There's nothing in the controls. Okay, so it's real, but it's low. Um, now, that is the frequency of gene editing. In the first paper where I show you the herpes, the two to four percent, I'll say it was a single cut, so there's a lot of repair. Here we're trying to do two. So it's possible we had degradation here. And what kills me in this experiment is that I don't have a big enough group to achieve statistical significance, okay? Because we just can't an experiment multiple times. But if you look at the CCC DNA per cell by digital PCR, you can see, and I should label these, but the treated groups in light gray, either at the earlier time point or late, are both reduced relative. And in fact, it's not too different from what I showed you herpes. It's, a, it's not quite a log here, but there's something. Uh, but neither of those achieve statistical significance. Just because they're reduced. Basically, so if I understand, one way you were trying to track 
the efficacy of your method is mutation, but of course, if the DNA is degraded, exactly. you wouldn't be so then you look at the amount. Mm -hmm. It does look like it's trending downward. Yeah, but it's trending. Yeah. So I should say that you know in the herpes, and I didn't mention this. If you if you say I got rid of well, let's see 90 percent, then if you go back and say you have the herpes that are left, some of it shows the telltale mutation. But it's a relatively low percent. In this case, you could look at gene products, right? Uh, uh Am I wrong? Yeah, you could anything coming off the DNA. That would be you could. And, and, yeah, and you know they all suffer from the same problem: is that the effect size relative to the group size is not enough. You know, and yeah. and also from one, you know, I don't want to keep running assays until I find one that dribbles over the over the line, right? So, so what we took from this is we definitely have gene editing. Um, we. The other potential interpretation is, you know, we had gene editing, you know, arguably looked better at the earlier time point. When I take away any technical error, we start to refill the reservoir with intact virus again. Um, you know, and, and, and it would take a little bit of time for that to manifest as CCT DNA. Viral loads definitely start to come up immediately. So here's, you know, here's our infected animals. We put them on Entecavir. This is the Entecavir. You know, it's continued through this period after AV. When we take away the integrator, everything comes back up. And there's no different speed controls. So we definitely didn't cure these animals. It's not enough. But the reservoir can really refill here. And nobody knows that that's true for HSV. In fact, our data says it probably doesn't replenish. Here we know it does. So we need to have good, good infection. So, so uh, for uh, HSV, uh -huh. so that was a single cut or double. That's good. It's two times. Yeah. So in that case, I remember that uh, looks like the mutation rates is much higher. Um, yeah, we have, there's actually data for it if you dig deep in, I think, the supplemental stuff in the native communication paper that um, it, it, the, the mutation rate is actually inverse to the, to the, to the loss, or to the reduction of, of overall load. So if we do the experiment with a single cutter, with in the optimized version now, the really good AD, you know, we really have figured out you see mutation rates in the 20, 30 percent range. When you do the two cutter, yeah. the mutation rates are lower because I think, right, yeah, they get they lost. get lost and you yeah. don't see them. So in order to have that mutation, you have to have sort of a single functional cut that yeah. has time to mutate and then repair. Okay. So that was I wonder, you know, if your experiments here have a, a single cuts. As a control. Yeah, that's what I, uh, you know, that's a really good, that's a really good point. And we're going to be luckily doing things like yeah. that in the future. And it was interesting, it was interesting in herpes. You know, I'd just like to see whether we have that same observation here, because I think we might. I think there's a question back here as well. Yeah. So I understand that your HPV experiment was with much left mice. Yeah. How did you decide on dosage? Because it looks like you're also using a different gene editing tool you mentioned where. Those four types up front in your talk, and here you're using the cast space CRISPR, mm -hmm. and with HSP, you're using that mega. The mega right. So, how did you why did you switch that tool? What dosage did you select? Because, like you mentioned, HSP is a smaller population of target cells. With the liver, do you know how much was infected, how many target cells you're going after? And um, I think those were, connected. yeah. So, in the, in, depending on the model. Of a humanized mouse will typically have anywhere between 10 to 90 percent engraftment, so 10 to 90 percent of the liver will be human hepatocytes. Um, these were thought to be pretty good mice, so at the higher levels of that, um, yeah, there's a lot of target there. We work with Cas9 because we don't have you know a set of two meganucleases for hepatitis B, so we just couldn't. We want to fix that. But that's the, that you know that was the case when we did this, um, and then in terms of dose, it's a complete guess. Essentially, the idea we understand the limits of AAV. AAV we think of as a benign delivery mechanism. You can run into trouble if you put too much in. I mean, you've seen this in human clinics. I mean, there have been some deaths if you give too much. So, so we basically just push it up close to the level that we know is you know the maximal, and then dial it back. So there's nothing more than that. In the herpes stuff, we've really started to do some real work and understand the trade-off of time versus dose. And you know, as you start to get closer to thinking about a human trial, you, you want to get that dose down. 
So did you optimize the AAV for this HPV model? Uh, the AAV here is LKO3, which is developed by Mark K via kind of a acid shuffling approach and then screen in FRG minus. So then we developed to deliver to these. And I don't think I show you the data in this model, but it delivers very well. It works like he said, doesn't deliver to all mice, doesn't deliver in our hands to UPA SID mice. So that's um, that's another commercial model you can do. Doesn't deliver there well at all. That, so it's back a year trying to figure that out. Um, so yeah, you, so we had the right AV for this, as far as I know. Uh, okay, so why you know why the difference in effectiveness? Well, of course, there are different viruses. Maybe there's biology here. Um, and again, that's why you want to have some people who kind of understand both viruses. Um, I'm fascinated with the idea that meganucleases may actually be better for anything about our genome. Our genomes tend to be very heavily chromatinized. I will simply point out that meganucleases evolved in yeast, and they have evolved to deal with chromatinized parts. Cas9 evolved in bacteria. So there may be differences uh, in how they deal with heavy chromatization. Uh, we're also, because they're so small, we can use self complement or AAV. Um, so, very fast primary AAV. I mentioned you take out all the guts of AAV except the inverted terminal repeats. AAV is a single stranded DNA genome. When it goes into a cell, uh, you have to first fill in the other side. Okay, so that's called second strand synthesis. It's done with cellular DNA machinery, and you wait until you get a double strand genome, and then you start making stuff. When you put in CRISPR Cas, AAV has a very strict limit to how big something can be. It simply won't form the captives go in. So CRISPR Cas picks up almost all of it. So you put it in, you wait for that to fill in your production. With AAV, or excuse me, with magnetic because they're so small, you actually put them in as inverted repeats of themselves. So this thing goes into the cell as a single strand of DNA. As soon as it's in, it flips on itself. It, is self complementary and you can get instant and high level expression. So that's one of the advantages of, of meganucleases. Um, and then, of course, this idea of just iterative improvement in the therapy. So, you know, this is a $11 mouse, I think, <laughs> you know, when you buy them. This looks much more used. Uh, an academic price for one of these mice is $3,500. Um, you know, enough said, if you're private, it's more than that. Okay, so there's different models, and, and you know, you guys know this well. There's transgenic mice, but they don't have CCC DNA. People can even just slam huge amounts into the tail vein. That's just weird to me. You know, that's really don't like the idea of that. Um, in the gene editing field, there's been uh, I've seen you know some folks using this AAV. We're basically have an AAV virus that contains the hepatitis B genome, and you put it in, and you have most of the sequence of AAV. Uh, it, it's an interesting model. Of course, it's not CCT DNA, and I'm not sure it's chromatinized like HPV. It's not maintained like HPV. So we really like humanized liver models because you are actually dealing with the actual CCT DNA. It can replicate in those mice. I just think it's the closest we're going to get in the mouse to looking at, at human infection. Um, so I mentioned the FRG mouse. There's these UPA skids uh, that, that you could also work with companies to do. Um, but, I, you know, I sum up all this with just saying they're fragile mice, that it's, they're hard to handle, um, at least in academic labs, when, you know, you're, you're doing a bunch of different stuff, you don't have quite the quality control, just the, you know, the dead beat staff who only does this, they're hard to maintain. And I've heard this from multiple folks. So we looked at, uh, were there more robust models for liver humanization? And we settled on this NSG his mouse that you can buy for about a hundred and some odd bucks. Um, and again, it has an underlying liver lesion that will allow humanization and it's immunosuppressed. So you can actually put human hepatocytes into it. Um, it it's an alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, deficiency model. Um, but the mice are generally healthy and you can actually handle them. And it's just been used in academic labs. Again, mostly, well, exclusively for studies of A1 deficiency. So uh, the paper that first described this was uh, from the Mueller lab, uh, Burrell did this, uh, when they showed that you could liver humanize these mice. 
Um, and then, you know, the, 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 basically they express this uh, this PIC allele about the one antitrust. And so it has a folding, appropriate folding uh, 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 dysregulation. So, you know, we, we kind of think of A1 deficiency as a lung issue, but well, it's liver people. So you understand there's substantial liver issues. So they will study that. Um, but you can repopulate them with human hepatocytes, and they show that you could do this, and you got nice levels of serine albumin. Um, and you could actually show there were human hepatocytes there. So I, I think at the gene therapy meeting, we were chatting and, and said, you know, it'd be interesting to see if you could infect those animals with hepatitis B. So we took that model up over, bought them, bought, bought the mice. You can buy them from standard suppliers. Um, you just find a nice source of human hepatocytes, you put them in, you wait over some time, and then we have access to hepatitis B and not great work. They do need some preconditioning. So you can either use antifats or you can use monoprotoline just to knock this damaged liver down and make a little bit more room. And in our hands, everything worked pretty nicely the first try. So we tried two different donors and you can see that over time, we have a nice slow increase in a human albumin. Typically for these models, uh, everybody's looking for this sort of magic number of one uh, milligram per milliliter of human albumin, and that suggests you have an epigraph that leads to useful for studies. Uh, ten's better, but but one's kind of what we were looking for. Um, okay, so this is just showing differences. We we consistently find that monoprotoline therapy is better than the antifas, um, just in terms of the ultimate graph we get. So that's our standard now. Um, but this is what they look like. So here's the native uh, Swiss Webster mouse. So nice, healthy liver. You can see that the naive uh, PIS mice uh, have uh, an unhappy liver before you do anything. And then once you put in your additional insult, either antifas or monoprotoline, you're clearly causing a lot of liver to grow. So you have plenty of room. And then you can put in the human hepatocytes and they grow in very visually obvious uh, clusters within the animals. They have this um, steatotic appearance. You can really see the stains oil red out. So they look like this. The steatosis is very common across all these liver models. Um, and it's interesting to know whether it actually has relevance to, you know, to the biology of how things behave. Um, so here you can see they stain really, really nicely with human cytokeratin 18. Um, and then if you infect, well, here you can see again just another one. So here are areas of uh, human CK18. Uh, you can see these kind of periporal regions that, that stain well. But they support uh, the infection of hepatitis B really, really nicely. Okay, so, um, you know, this is our, our first cohort. We got already got uh, animals with copies, uh, viral levels over 10 to the 8 copies right now. Um, so very, very useful for studying. And then if you look at where the um, where the hepatitis B is, here's the hepatitis B surface engine staying nice and bright, and it correlates really nicely with the human CK18. So that's the localization. So it is the human hepatocytes that get that. Um, there's CCC DNA. I won't go through this too much, but there's there's CCC DNA detectable. Uh, there's total DNA detectable, and then CCC DNA as well. Some of the animals are below the limits of detection in, in this assay. So we're working on that. And thank you for your resources that you guys have for making sure that we're doing everything with the state of the art for those. Um, so at least in the first set of experiments, these work really nicely in terms of studying antiviral therapeutics. So here's uh, animal street with a bear. So we'll see a nice two log decrease. Uh, after a couple of weeks of integrative therapy, we actually combined integrative with a uh, capsid assembly modulator, um, but didn't see any, any uh, synergistic effect, at least in our hands there. And then finally, uh, as gene therapists, we get back to what we want to do with this. What we find is that they transduce uh, really, really nicely. Uh, with with GFP, so you can see that uh, you can get uh, really nice transduction. This is the LKO3 uh, virus that I told you about. It's supposed to work so well on humanized mice, and it really does. Uh, this is a control vector that's also reported to work well for transduction, but didn't work nearly as well in our hands. So we're sticking with this LKO3 for now, as well as some other candidates. 
All right, just to wrap up, what are we doing with this now? We're finally getting back to doing this and that thing. I don't have any results yet to show you, but um, basically going back to, to asking, you know, can we do bigger groups? Um, so these are all roughly uh, about eight to 10 animals per group now that, you know, we've had enough animals to show good in graphing to do that. Um, looking at the LPO3 AV, as well as another one called NP50 Badge developed uh, in Sydney that, uh, that looks like a great candidate as well. Uh, and then various commutations of, 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 of controls and, uh, and so forth. So that's all cooking. Uh, just to wrap up, you know, I think that there's, I think there's, you know, there's light for this. Now that we can actually start to iterate, I'm excited. So we need to increase the gene editing efficiency. Um, we're interested in Cas9 variants, you know, like Cas9. There's all sorts of other things. You know, companies have their 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 preferred types. So you know, whatever we get hands on, we're interested in testing to see if those work. Uh, of course, we really like the idea of meganucleases, and if, if we can get those, we'll look at those. Um, I'm interested in questions like the long if we reduce CCP gene at just a percent, right? Or do we get this receiving like we were talking about? And I'm very interested in finding that out. Um, we're very interested in the question of integrated HPV. Um, so, in principle, if HPV is integrated, but it still contains our site, we should be able to get gene editing. We might even get a decision. What does that mean? Um, you know, we're going to see genomic development. We start cutting pieces, pieces of that out. Are we going to see a lot of free ends? You know, guys, be in an increase in overall integrated loads. That's also a possibility. Or maybe we'll see reduction in surface engine. Um, because some of that coming from the integrated form. And so lots of interesting things, I'm not sure I have strong predictions. And then I chatted with a couple of you already today, really interested in getting away from AV, frankly, despite as much as we've done, it's gonna be hard to manufacture AV at the amounts that we actually need and start to think about. Going to fifty million people living with this virus, um, I'm not sure that's really practical. So we wanna look at those. Uh, I think I wanted to say all that, but other than the last one, you know, this is a cost effective option. Um, they're robust as can be, there's no problem taking care of them. It's all in about $300 a mouse, including your personnel costs, so it's not bad at all. And with that, I think I just yeah, need to thank all the folks. I won't read the names, but uh, a, a lot of team and funders and, and, and uh, in many years of work, but I think I hope we're at the point that we're going to see some rapid progress uh, soon. Thank you.